All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Pursuit of Ownership. It is Peyton. I'm here with Tyler for a nice introduction. Tyler, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Um, you know, you took this one solo, and uh, I was trying to make the interview, um, but logistics just didn't permit. I was actually putting up some Christmas lights, and we kind of ran long. So, But I was really happy to, to listen to this interview, and I think you absolutely killed it. I think that uh, the person you interviewed actually killed it, too. They seemed almost rehearsed in, in uh, being on podcasts. I was impressed. Yeah, so I obviously I've talked to him before. I, I I'm pretty good friends with him and he just like he's so good at just telling a story and yeah. it makes it super easy for people like us cuz I like normally have to like interject question about like ooh, we need to get this detail or that like that detail but uh, he just he provides them all so it's fantastic. But super cool, super cool um story here. So graduated in 2018 and right trying to buy a practice, trying to buy a practice in his hometown. And then after about a year and a half, he stumbles upon two. So it's, it's so crazy how those things work out. Um, but I don't want to spoil too much of it, but he, he's a grinder and he was willing to get it done. So it's, yeah, uh, I just think it's, it's super impressive too, because I, you know, I, my heart really goes out to the people that want to go back to their hometowns unless their hometown is like some like major urban metropolitan area or something like that but you know it, it's like it's tough if you're trying to go back to where you came from and you come from like a smaller town or something like that uh you know it, it's so restrictive because you're trying to you know be within arm's reach of maybe your parents or like wherever you're trying to settle down and and uh, if you don't have a, a larger search area like say the state or just sort of a region of the country or something like that you know it can really uh you know restrict your criteria and it's just it's just kind of a tough non-negotiable um to deal with and uh you know, I just think it's great that he was able to find these two opportunities and and uh, and make something out of it. So, uh, yeah, I hope everyone enjoys it. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Pursuit of Ownership. It is Peyton here, and I have an interview that has actually been a long time coming. Um, this is another fresh owner, and as you guys probably can imagine, most fresh owners don't have a whole lot of free time. Uh, and another great thing about this is this actually is one of my friends from school. So. He was a couple years ahead of me. I kind of realized as he was about to graduate that he was super invested in ownership and, you know, getting into an ownership position as soon as he could. So uh, I don't want to introduce too much about him, but uh, this is my friend Hasnain Shahid. Uh, Hasnain, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Good. Yeah, I, I'm sure your last couple of months have been crazy busy. Uh, am I correct in saying that? Oh yeah, I think that's an understatement. <laughs> Super busy. <laughs> I can only imagine. Yeah, this this interview I feel like has been attempted to be scheduled so many times, and we finally yeah. <laughs> managed to find a time kind of around Christmas where things mm -hmm. kind of calmed down a little bit. So um, I don't know when this is actually going to air, but it was nice that we could finally get this set up. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and kind of start from the beginning here. Uh, mm -hmm. Get the listeners a little bit of an idea of what you did to prepare for ownership, kind of what your school experiences was like, and then we'll go forward from there. Sounds good. So uh, ever since dental school, my first year, pretty much at the end of the first year, I knew I wanted to own a practice. Initially in dental school, I thought I wanted to go in the oral surgery route. Like I always, uh, to give you a little backstory of myself, I'm pretty young. I did a associate's degree or when I had my high school uh, diploma, I had my two years of college underneath my belt too. So when I graduated high school, I was 18, had my associate's degree because I took dual credit classes and all that. And the goal was for me, I was like, you know what, dental school, I got in dental school the first time around. I was going to be finished by like 24. I thought, you know, what if I want to do oral surgery? I'll do that till 30, 32 or whatever. And that was the route I was kind of going for. But after my first year of dental school, I was like, you know what, I don't think this is right for me. There's so many pros and cons of owning a practice versus six more years and this and that. So I, I talked myself into like, you know what, I want to own a practice because my parents have a gas station business and I've been in the business field for a while. And one of the reasons I came into dentistry was to be my own boss. So after first year, I knew that was the route to go. Then I was hard headed and listening to podcasts, going to CE courses. And we went to, was it Mark Costas to CE course together? All yeah, that was, was super you funny. There. We, we had traveled, we both had traveled from Texas and I just kind of like turned around. And I'm like, Hey, like, what are you doing here? <laughs> so that was, that was kind of when we both realized like, hey, we're both on the same page with ownership. But yeah, like you're saying, so you started getting yeah. into the CE so events. Started doing all that CE events. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, dental students, it's all free stuff or very discounted. Listen to a bunch of podcasts and 
getting my head pretty much strong in there. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to own a practice sooner than later. Like I, uh, I'm going to do it someday. So that was, that was the goal of dental school. And then just in school, doing everything I could clinically and mission trips and all that type of stuff to make sure I really had my knowledge down pretty good. And our school, Baylor, it typically prepares you real well for a lot of bread and butter dentistry stuff. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm actually just kind of curious. So I'm in my third year uh, and a lot of things have changed over the last couple of years. So I'm just curious what your clinical <laughs> experience like when you were going through the clinic at uh, Texas A&M. So, yeah, I forget Texas A&M now. <laughs> I entered Baylor and graduated from A&M. Um, it was, third year was great. A lot of hands-on type of stuff. I Fourth year, I feel like was my shebang year like i did so much more fourth year um i think third year is the year you're slowly figuring out clinical stuff by the end of the year i think i probably had like six like four or five crowns like it, it, third year i did a good amount of stuff but when i got into fourth year the teachers told me like my group leaders are like you know you're you're slacking on your crowns like my first a group leader appointment with my leader they did to tell you how good you're doing and bad you're doing or whatever and mm-hmm. the lady pretty much told me, she's like, no, you might not pass fourth year because you only got like four crowns and the requirements, like at least like 20 or something. And I was like, no, I, I haven't even started fourth year. And I started going like hardcore ever since she told me that, like telling me I'm not going to pass. Like, why would you tell me something like that? And by, by the time it was November, November of fourth year, I had done like 30 something crowns. Like I'd finished all my requirements by the November, December time of fourth year. Uh, and then, you know, I had my accident happen and everything, but I was one of the first people in the class to finish all the requirements and everything. So it was, I think it's kind of, when you know you have to do something, you can, you can adjust your schedule at that point to say, right, I want to schedule these crown people and fillings and this and that. Like I ended up pretty good. I was, except I was very purposeful at my schedule. And like at that time we had the scheduling coordinator schedule everything. I would purpose to give every patient my phone number and say, Hey, we're going to bring you in this date. And, really mess around every week to make sure I had everything blocked off, booked and everything and just purposely plan that way so I'd have it done. So my, my, my intention was like, I want to have my spring semester free so I could do more business stuff forever. But what ended up happening is I finished up with my requirements by like December. So that whole spring semester of school, I pretty much shadowed at all the specialty clinics and just walking around, seeing what they're doing and that type of stuff. So <laughs> it was good, but you have to be very purposeful in planning that stuff out. I'm not sure what yeah. that was new curriculum how that works now yeah yeah and i think that can go for any dental school just being purposeful and making sure you can be as efficient as you can with your schedule Mm because there's so many different things in dental school that can slow you down you know whether it's you know checkpoints and Mm -hmm. there's all the different paperwork you have to fill out so being even go for it even even the the basic stuff too i realized too like if you have a patient you know hey this guy's coming in looking at your schedule like two days before and saying all right someone's coming in tomorrow he's coming in for a filling and I remember starting in third year, I would plan out, okay, he's coming in for a filling. How exactly am I going to do that appointment? What am I going to set up? What shots am I going to give? What material am I going to have out? To the exact, like, burr. How many burrs am I using? And then you get more advanced, and you're like, you know what? Now this guy's coming in. I'm going to try to do three fillings on one side and maybe add this thing up and scheduling-wise. Because my appointments would be efficient enough that I would do a lot more on one of my appointments or someone else's two or three. But you got to, like strategically schedule that type of thing and think it through yeah absolutely yeah i I think that's something that a lot of uh, the listeners could benefit to if they're still in school and listening to these of course um Mm -hmm. so you said you're efficient with your clinic time you had the podcast you did the ce uh what what did your ce look like so were you doing a lot of stuff online were you traveling to a lot of things what did that look like for you i I was I was doing a, a good amount of traveling, like a lot of, especially a lot of the local ones. Um, I did like, there's a, a, a productive dentist Academy in Dallas, actually Bruce Baird thing. Yeah, absolutely. And because I uh, was a dental student, they gave me a good discount for that. And I was pretty much sitting there with a bunch of like dentists and team members and stuff. Now I didn't have my own team or anything. So I was just kind of sitting around with other people, listening to them, all the Mark Costas stuff breakaway uh, seminars and stuff like a lot of the stuff you can learn early on are like business stuff like mindset type of things you can't really do much clinical stuff because you're kind of like not there yet and your school's kind of doing that part for you so some of that stuff some things i did online um here and there with some <clears throat> like youtube or some like dental pages and stuff a lot of that but 
And then on, in the summers, I would do a lot of clinical stuff, like or during the breaks, like they'd have free mission trips around like the area or the schools integrate with some of these things. So I would do that to do my clinical stuff. And then, you know, taking, I was, I broke my breaks up into like half dental, clinical, whatever, half relax, and then, you know, family time. So you got to make sure like you don't overdo it either. This dentistry we're going to do for whole lives and everything, but uh, make sure you take out that relaxed time for yourself too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've definitely found with breaks, you know, you can obviously, there's plenty of time to do like family stuff and all that, but there's also some extra time, you know, with not having to go to clinic anymore where you can mm-hmm. really knock out some good personal development, some good CE, you know, what, whatever it is you feel like would mm-hmm. best benefit you. I mean, even um, when I was a, a D1, D2, there were these, uh, like, all, especially all the podcasts and other things, you'd list, put some headphones on and you're doing your lab work or something and, you know, you're gaining information. I typically would uh, listen to music or something and I'm like, you know what? You know how much time I waste just putting music in my ear? And uh, I think the only time I listen to music now is like at the gym where I can't, I can't listen to a podcast and I can't focus. It's just like, you got to be some music grind. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it sounds like you were super effective with your time in school. So once you graduated, what, uh, what was your plan as far as, I know, obviously you're in ownership now, um, but I guess kind of go into when you graduated, what you did after and how you started preparing and kind of looking forward towards ownership. So my, uh, so my, my D4 year when I was about to graduate in that October, November time, I was, I started reaching out to doctors in my area and I'm about two hours away from a big city, like my hometown, but the goal is to go back over there and kind of buy a practice. So probably in that, October, November time, I was reaching out to dentists and stuff, especially it was like Thanksgiving break. Sent, I actually went to the, physically each person and I, I kept up with them throughout the years and stuff to see, you know, who's retiring, who's not and all that. And I tell people too all the time, like it's cool to write letters and stuff to these people, but it's even better if you can go physically to their office and say, hey, I'm a dentist about to graduate. Like, are you looking to retire? What's your game plan? And it makes a bigger emphasis. So I had narrowed it down to like, four dentists who, or like there's three dentists who wanted to sell the practices and one the one was like in november time we we're talking and everything got lunch we got serious in like december and then come january they end up saying you know what doc I actually i can't retire like we start talking numbers and they're like you know i can't retire or something like i don't know what it was and i'm like okay bummer and then the second guy around like february ish time we started talking ate lunch agreed on some things here and there Something happened. They're like, you know what, doc, I, I don't think I'm ready to retire either. And the last one was like right before I took my licensing exam, the REB in April. And this guy was like small practice, didn't take insurance. Um, he like is 78 years old and he has some medical problems. But I'm like, this guy for sure is going to retire. Like, it's all good. Like, it's going to happen. <laughs> and he only, he's only working like three days a week. And then I take my REB exam and I come back and I'm like, you know, I got to apply for my license stuff. Uh, and the doc's like, you know, I realize I think I, I still want to keep grinding in dentistry. And I'm like, really? Could, could we make it work in some way where I, I come in a few days a week, you hire me or something? We we do associate to ownership thing? And he's like, no, I'm good. So at that time, it was like May, May-ish time or whatever, when we we're getting our licenses and all that. And it takes like a month, you know, to get your license and all that good stuff. So I was like, you know what? I guess it wasn't my fate to buy a practice. Maybe this wasn't ready to happen. Let me go look for a job now. And the job I want to do, I want to make sure it follows like two points. Either I want to make, and then one of my mentor people told me this, he said, either make a lot of money or go learn a lot. Or if you can do both, even better. So I was like, okay, let me at least hit those two things up. So I got one job in my town that was like just a Saturday, uh, every Saturday. It was only like a five hour thing just to kind of keep foot in my town. Cause I thought, you know, then maybe this dentist eventually he'll retire or something. Uh, that's the sole reason for that. And then, I ended up working at a DSO clinic like an hour and 20 minutes away from me. It was a place that they did a bunch of dentures and extractions, one of those corporate places. And the only reason I chose that is because that was the, the experience. You learn a lot. There was a periodontist there. Uh, he was like, you know, like if you're a foreign trained grad, you have to come to the U.S. and you can, you can work as a general dentist for a couple of years or whatever. Like it was some situation like that. So he was working there and it was like an hour and 20 minutes away from me like every day. But they told me they like you know we'll, we'll go teach you about implants and like a CE course will pay for it and there's a period on us over there and I'm like you know what say no more like if I get to work with a specialist like why not so I Absolutely. took that gig 
And I like well, literally the first weekend I joined, they sent me to uh, Arizona and they paid <laughs> they paid for a CE course for me. So I placed implants like the very first weekend of working, and I got to work with this periodontist like two days a week, three days a week, and it was great. Like I did that for about six months, and it's way different when you get to work with someone else who who's a specialist and they kind of know what they're doing and everything. So I learned a ton from that guy. I placed like 30, 40 implants and stuff, and it was good. And the other two days. Like the good thing is making sure everyone who's looking for jobs and all that, like make sure everyone's your, you know, your reps in your area, your supply reps and all these people, because you don't know what people know. There's one guy who kept contact with me, a shine rep, no, as a Patterson rep, like the equipment company guy. And I was asking him, Hey, um, do you know anyone who's hiring or selling the practice or whatever? And he'd kind of keep me updated. And one day he told me, he's like, no doc, I, uh, we have this healthcare practice. It's like one of those, HIV run clinics where there's like a medical uh, nurse practitioner on one side and a dental side on the other. And they're like, they haven't had a dentist for like three, uh, three months there. And they're looking for someone real bad, but nobody wants to work there. And I was like, really? And he starts telling me about how this place would give like a thousand dollars a day, like minimum or something like that. And I was like, you know what? Two days a week, like sure. Why not? In Texas over here, like your minimum you're going to get every day is like between five and 700. So if I have yeah, to absolutely. go drive to make a thousand bucks, why not? And then long story short on that, I ended up doing it and I'm pretty big into negotiating and stuff. And uh, I negotiated at, like a daily rate over there and I got them to pay me 1600 a day plus a hotel stay and breakfast. Like every day oh I'd show up. So Wait, I was, okay. <laughs> Hold on. Just to clarify. So how far out of, are you out of school at this point when you get this $1,600 a day minimum? like two months <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely incredible i just wanted to clarify because I, I know when i first heard that i was like did he really say sixteen hundred dollars but he did so yeah and it, it was one of those like what other options did the people have they didn't have another dentist and i was willing to go work over there it's like two hours away and it was a great gig like i they say doc you can see as many patients as you want or as very little as you want and you can work whatever schedule you want but the thing is i was the only dentist there so that's where i like really built my confidence of like okay i have no one else to talk to and these days with like social media and stuff all these groups out there if you have any dental questions you can call up a friend or something if you need to but it really forces you to like you're the doc kind of figure it out situation so i did that two days a week i ended up going to three days a week it's like two and a half days even the half a day like i got a good gig i was like hey can you guys pay me the same even if I only worked a half a day too and they're like yeah sure we'll, we'll do it so oh that gig God. was a it was, it was only supposed to be a temporary gig for like two or three months until like a, a permanent doctor came on board but the permanent doctor like was trying to sell his practice and he didn't get it sold till like seven months later so i i did that all the way up to like covid till march so i paid a good amount of money with that um so that was good good experience so i was in my first like eight or seven to eight months i was driving like two hours here staying in a hotel i was driving an hour and a half to another clinic and it was like i was filling up my tank twice a week in gas but i was like you know what i'm young i can go grind go hustle like it's no big deal um yeah that's, so, that's super cool yeah you you're willing to do whatever it takes to you know get that experience and also you know make a decent living for yourself too um yeah. so yeah like you're saying you you worked in a couple offices you had the chance to see some different places and then at the same time you still had your foot in at that office in your hometown correct yes exactly so okay. COVID hits now in like March ish, and then that practice was paying me real well. Uh, no, so sorry, in Jan in January of this year or that that year, twenty twenty, I left the the imp the implant practice. I was like, you know what, the periodontist, the specialist, he was leaving to go home somewhere uh, back home to California. So I thought, I was like, you know what, let me not stay here. I can't learn anything else over here, and this drive is killing me. So, and then my other ho hometown doc, who was a uh, I was there working Saturdays. He started getting sicker and sicker. And he said, hey, can you come work for me a few more days? And I thought, okay, great. I'll work two more. I'll leave that one clinic, work here. And then eventually I'll try to buy this one if that works out. And uh, uh, what do you call it? So I left that in December, came here in January, half in my hometown and half I was still doing that little drive. Then COVID hit and then that job, like everything shut for a couple months or whatever. That job I was getting good paid in. They're like, you know, doc, we got to let you go because it's COVID, we don't have any patients. And then that full-time doctor came in finally. So that job left, so I was only in my hometown. And that doctor, he got real sick. So 
so he ended up giving me a full-time gig like four and a half days a week so i was like okay you know what i'm in my hometown money's not as great as it was but at least maybe this will be my practice i'll, I'll buy and i started talking to him about selling the practice and all that and it's crazy what some doctors especially older ones they think their practices are worse like this guy's been here forever and he he valued so much for his practice like it just didn't make sense so around that like like I told my brother and my family, I was, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try to buy this guy's practice. If it doesn't work out, like at, at some certain point, I'm gonna, we're just going to do a startup or look for something else. Like I, I can't like, keep trying to buy a practice that's not there. So I might do that startup route. So we hit, um, June, what is it, August time? And I had some, you know, keeping up open with um, one thing I always do is make sure I'm, conversations kept open with everyone around me from dental supply people to like DSO people, whatever. There's this corporate place that they always like ask me, like, hey, Doc, they have like 30 practices and they're like smaller practices. They asked me if I wanted to work for them. And I'll say like, no, I have a job or whatever. And one day they told me during this like COVID time, like, hey, Doc, we're, we're trying to pick up like three practices and one's in your area, it's like 20 minutes away. Um, we're buying it for like pennies on the dollar, but we just need someone to work there. And they, they described the practice to me and I was like, I know which one they're talking about. And I'm like, um, I'll let you know in a bit. And so I, what I ended up doing is I called that practice up and the guy, and I physically went to him and I'm like, hey, are you selling your practice? And he's like, yeah, I'm ready to get out of this game. And like we negotiated in a way that I was like, doc, I'm a local hometown guy. Like you don't want to sell to a corporate. Like I can't give you the money as quick as they can, but I will make it so that it'll be a better long-term thing for you. Like people remember me and sell like some corporation and all that. So that kind of led to that thing. So they, they kind of gave me the hint about that practice. And then me and the doc, we worked it out and all that. And that's going into our practice one situation. Oh my gosh. Um, so but you essentially <laughs> took the practice out from like corporate's hands, essentially. Yeah. Is what you did. <laughs> Pretty that's much. Awesome. I used my local hometown vibe to <laughs> really that's get it. Killer. Oh my gosh. I love that. So just to clarify, so you never actually sent out mailers. You All of your networking was going to doctors, talking to reps, that kind of thing, correct? Yes. That's cool. I was gonna, yeah. I was going to do the mail thing, but it was, it seemed like it was too much work to just try to reach out to people. And like, especially in a town, like I, for, for me, I knew I wanted to practice in my town where I was born, raised and everything pretty much. And around here, there's like 10 docs. And then I told myself, you know what, I could potentially work in another 45 mile radius, if anything, but I wouldn't want to practice super far away. And then with some of those things like you can plan it out yourself, like who's there, who's not and contact the people yourself if you can physically go there i feel like that always helped me better visit it because like you're a dental student sometimes you're just like you know you have free time and the breaks and all that either calling a place up or going them yourself because when you send a postcard a lot of the times it's like they won't respond back to you or they'll be like no who's this guy I think he is but when you physically go somewhere like they're not gonna deny you it's like oh yeah we see him like <laughs> yeah it's it's much harder to ignore a person in your office than it is you know a postcard or whatever it might be but it, it makes sense if you're like not from the area, you're like trying to go somewhere way different, you're not there, then yeah, it makes sense to do some, or if your area is very big. Yeah, but, yeah, I, I think it's really cool that you use that that hometown piece to your advantage because uh, I feel like with a lot of people, they want to go to big places or they're not from there, so they don't necessarily know how to go about it. Um, but in your situation with, you know, it being your hometown, uh, you can definitely use that to your advantage. And I, I think you did a super, super good job of utilizing that. Uh, yeah. so yeah so you said august of 2020 was when you got into your first practice is that correct uh so it was september by the time the paperwork loan all this type of stuff happened it was september for this okay one. Gotcha. Um, so it was it, it came down to like when you well, i think the biggest thing that happened to me i went to the guy and so i have a brother who's at dental school as well he just graduated from houston and so I've been about out for about a year now or a year and some change. I went up to that guy and I had like a letter of intent made and everything to give to him. And we had agreed him on the terms and everything. And I pretty much told him that day, like, here's a letter of intent. I'm ready to get serious about it. And he is a three page document. These things are never like super legally binding, but they kind of are. And um, I think the other thing, money talks, like I gave him the document, I'm like, doc, I'm ready to go with this, sign this and everything, and let's get this deal going. And then he looks at the document and he's like, you know, I'll probably have to talk to my wife, my lawyer, and this and that about it. And I was like, Doc, how about this? 
I took out a check out of my pocket and I wrote down $5,000 on there. I'm like, doc, here, I'll give you the 5,000 letter of intent money right now. Cause I'm serious about this deal. We're going to, we're going to make it work. And he was like, you know what? Let's go ahead and do it and sign the paper. And he didn't even read the letter of intent or anything, but oh, ever since then, like, we, we, we made it work. Like everything was, was great. I feel like you went about this in like the most unorthodox way possible, but it worked out for you. So I guess that's how it counts, right? Sometimes you got to do what you got to (laughs) do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So what, uh, as far as this first practice goes, what uh, you want to give us some details on it, you know, what size it is, what it was doing, um, just, you know, surface level stuff like that. Yeah. So this practice was, um, it was doing around like 400, 30,000, 440-ish a year in production or production collection. The doctor had like 50% overhead type of thing. He was taking home at least like 230 a year. Um, he practices in this building that was like 3,000 square feet. There's a dental, where the dental clinic is. And it's like 2,000, 2,200 square feet or so. All right, guys. So that's going to wrap it up for part one. Uh, as you can see, he, uh, Dr. Shahid here, he's just a real hustler. He He's willing to do what it takes, um, whether it was in dental school or even after. Um, I know we talked about he was commuting an hour and a half for one of his jobs, and he was commuting two hours for the other job. Uh, I think it just really goes to show, like, if you get someone that's determined to do whatever it takes to reach their goals, then it, it's really going to end up positive. And I, I think we really need to applaud him for that. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, you know, I... I love the whole, you know, work smarter, not harder mantra, but it really helps if you work hard too. And uh, I think that's exactly what uh, Dr. Shahid was doing here. Um, Just really uh, maximizes opportunities and knew how to get himself in the right doors. And uh, there was just no lack of of hard work and just uh, being on the grindstone as much as he could uh, all along his path. So I'm really inspired uh, by his journey and how he just, you know, beat the pavement right out of school and was putting himself himself in these really unique opportunities. I thought uh, I was like really impressed with kind of the things that he was able to leverage himself into. And then um, he was just working so hard, um, harder than he really needed to. But I think when you just, you have that vision and you have a passion, there's just, uh, there's, there's not a lot of uh, things you're not willing to do. So um, great example of that. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And plus like $1,600 a day minimum. Like I, yeah, I've never heard of that even for crazy. a specialist, honestly. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. Uh, I think coming right out of school, $1,600 minimum. I mean, I mean, I think about what some of my classmates are are getting offered right now, and you know, you hear like you know somewhere from five, six hundred, seven hundred on the on the higher end, mm-hmm. and this guy just drilling around with sixteen hundred. What what do we know about that uh, type of opportunity? Did he say HIV was, clinic? Yeah, it was like an HIV clinic where it's like partners practitioner, part mm-hmm. dental. Um, and the funny thing was that the offer originally was uh, around a thousand, and he mm-hmm. decided to negotiate it up to sixteen hundred. Yeah, he's like, hey, if I'm going to be driving two hours, like, <laughs> I feel like it should be a little more. So I, and you guys will see this too with uh, the second episode. Uh, his negotiating skills are, are very on point. He mm-hmm. does not leave any stone unturned when it comes to negotiation. Yeah, right. I mean, he's just wringing the towel uh, out of everything that, that comes his way. And and I would agree, you know, that kind of commute. I mean, you, you need to be getting a pretty decent, yeah. uh, pretty decent floor. But I mean, man. Uh, he really did himself some favors there. So uh, that's just awesome. I'm going to take some pages out of his book for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we hope you guys enjoy this one and we'll uh, see you guys next week for the second part of our interview with Dr. Shahid.